Thank you, and I guess for need to say, uh, say or uh, fess up that I'm also at uh, doing work at Kearney and also at uh, down at Chapter still. So those of you who think the chapter has disappeared, the, it's changed hands and it's being run by a grower group down there, but we're still located uh, part of the time down at Chapter as well. Uh, appreciate the chance to be here today. I guess uh, I am glad to have to ha have a chance to follow uh, Pete on some of this because I've been really interested in the discussion and just sort of how a lot of the plants have been uh, performing in different parts of the valley. Uh, it's sort of nice to come and see some place that looks like it has at least a little bit more water. A lot of the cotton up here, it's harder to see soil in between the rows than it is in quite a few locations, like down in Florida, Tulare County, and Kings County, Western and Kern County. This time of year, there's actually some real uh, problem fields, obviously, where the growers probably have enough water maybe for a replant irrigation and maybe one additional irrigation year or maybe two. And so some of those types of fields, you know, to me, are every location scattered all over the valley, even competing with a couple hundred thousand acres. But in quite a few locations, it seems like most of the places I've looked, we've seen uh, low, uh, in general, early first wheat ranch, which is kind of a good sign of being able to really deliver a little bit of uh, cleanliness in terms of development. And it, like Pete mentioned, or like some of the data that we showed, uh, some of the observations have been that uh, the early fruit set applications in a couple plots of places I know down in Kern County. In general, it has been you know, quieter earlier uh, set up in terms of early fruit retention and all. Um, and again, it may not be as appropriate up here, but one of the things that Dan will probably talk quite a bit about uh, irrigation and water management options and all in a year like this one, but there are quite a few locations I think where the die is kind of cast that they're in the probably two bale yield potential range because their strategy or their requirement just with their water situation has been uh, that the plants are not going to use a high level of uh, fertilizer or nitrogen because they're just going to flat run out of water and you can tell the plants have adjusted by having significantly smaller average leaf size and it's just sort of a hunger now significantly smaller plant and I think when you get down in sort of the southern uh, ends of this general area, of course we get down toward the ability in San Joaquin and some places like the East I've seen a lot of fields that sort of fit that description and there's really quite a few fields that look like that you know scattered across the valley this year so the management practices you kind of will get laughed out of the room if you go in and start saying uh, are uh, need for PGRs and uh, you know pretty much the water issue is the dominant one I think across most of these sites. Um, I'm glad there were the, 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 the discussion about uh, about uh, white fly and about aphids. At least uh, to me the aphid question is one that we're trying to we're used to doing retention monitoring and bigger monitoring. Uh, but we've tried to sort of pay a little more attention across our variety on Pete and Larry Godfrey's recommendations just to keep our eyes open for white fly and uh, aphid issues across a lot of different locations. So I'm glad to hear that kind of discussion. Um, I'll mention a few things. If there are any particular questions, uh, it's, it's sort of not, not always uh, anybody's favorite topic, but I, I said I would say a few things about fusarium and what we've seen this year uh, for race four fusarium issues. And uh, again, we can elaborate on any of this or if who are tired of hearing anything about fusarium, you can uh, you know, throw your direction or something to get the hint. Um, what we've seen in general this year is uh, requests for field visits, uh, 
again, we still are finding some newly identified fields that they had not recognized, or at least the growers and consultants hadn't recognized Fusarium previously on those field sites. So we pretty much have locations all the way from uh, Merced County all the way down through Kern County uh, and uh, had requests for additional field calls. additional sites again this year. Uh, one of the things I guess that I would say uh, I think people have really paid attention to is all the growers who have field sites uh, that have had some of these experiences where they'll see the Fusarium Race 4 kind of blow up to a level where they'll see you know 25, 50 percent or greater stand losses in either spotty areas or significant areas of field. Uh, I think growers are doing a really good job of paying attention to the to the the resistant variety or more tolerant variety recommendations. So more, more times than not, uh, in, in areas where say we're looking at a new field site that's been identified as a race four fusarium site, uh, other sites in that same general area are already planted uh, in general to some of the more uh, resistant varieties. Okay, the problem is that if for those of you who've been trying to keep up with any of this, uh, the available, we've been doing screening work for about 10 years on this and we're really upping the ante on how much effort we're putting into upland and Akela screening to try to identify the better varieties in the uplands. And uh, we still have a long ways to go, I think, in, in, in having something ready to go. I think some of the seed companies like Phytogen are talking about maybe having some more tolerant uh, to race four FOB varieties of uplands within maybe the next couple of years. And I think we're probably on the same uh, kind of trajectory with some of the, the public screening efforts. So what we have is we have, uh, I'll just give you a real brief picture, we still have access to Mauricio Vinova, who's a USDA breeder uh, geneticist, who now is working instead of out of Shaftery, he's working out of Lubbock, Texas. Uh, but he's working with us, so we essentially have a public breeding program going on here in California. We have screening sites in the Tipton area in Tulare County, in Western Kern County, another field screening site, and then we're doing some extensive work on uh, 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 breeding populations that we're uh, putting together at the Kearney Research Center. And we're also doing uh, FOB screening in greenhouse settings in the, at the Kearney Research Center location. So, there are new materials that we've released uh, four PEMAs in the last uh, 18 months. We have about another six to eight PEMAs in the public breeding program that we hope to release within the next year. And uh, so there, there's, I think, some good progress being made both in the public efforts and then also in the private company efforts on coming up with some new materials. And hopefully we'll have some things in the next few years uh, coming out in the uplands to uh, improve the opportunities in that area. Um, just as a, as a warning, I think most everybody knows this, but we still are at a, at a, a situation, I think, in parts of the San Joaquin Valley where you can have some really major, if you grow a susceptible variety, you can have really major increases in the amount of inoculum that's reproduced from this pathogen. And it can take as little as a one year rotation with a, with a highly susceptible variety and you can blow up the inoculum levels to a level where you'll have a hard time dealing with them for several years after that. Uh, particularly if you don't grow the most resistant varieties that are available. So again, just a heads up, the easiest time to see it was basically back in the spring when you had plants that were in the pre-bloom stage, uh, even better yet at the seedling stage. So. Uh, Again, I didn't get any very many calls from up in this area, so hopefully that means you don't have uh, real widespread issues. I know I'm aware of a fair number of fields in this area that do have the race for fusarium. So, I don't know, are there any questions anybody has on fusarium? You've heard uh, enough, too much? Don't want to hear any more about fusarium? <laughs> okay. Um, and like I said, but what, we'll, what we try to do is we try to make available through uh, uh, Owen Taylor's uh, AgFax uh, updates on Fusarium, and then we also have a University of California cotton website. So all of the screening data that we have on every cultivar, the experimentals plus the commercial 
uh, materials are all included on that website. So you can go in, you can call Farm Advisors or myself, or you can take a look at the UC Cotton website, which is pretty easy to find. It's just, uh, if you type in Cotton Info, just C-O-T-T-O-N-I-N-F-O dot ucdavis dot edu, uh, it'll find it real easily. That one, that website will pop up and you can go in there and there's about, uh, probably about the last five years of summaries of screening information on Fusarium are posted on that website. Okay, um, and I guess the only other couple things that popped into my head, at least for this time of year, and we haven't talked much about plant mapping, I imagine Dan's going to talk some about this, but I know with our crew we've been trying to uh, essentially switch over mostly to looking at nodes above white flower, nodes above yellow flower counts as a really easy thing to do this time of year along with looking at upper canopy internode lengths. So uh, again, this isn't the type of year where as many people are likely to really just pump a lot of nitrogen fertilizer out there. It's not maybe the kind of year where you have too much concern about over irrigating. Uh, but again, I think it's such a nice, easy to use tool to get a general idea about whether you have plants that are going to be approaching cutout in you know, a couple weeks or if they're very rapidly approaching cutout. Uh, one of the things that I've been trying to preach to a few of the people we've been talking to down in Kern County is we have a lot of fields, especially in parts of western Kern County where people are using saline water this year. And quite a few of the fields are pretty rapidly progressing. They're going, they've got good fruit set on them. They're kind of modest in size. And so they're, if you looked at them a couple weeks ago, they were probably at about uh, six to seven nodes above yellow flower on Pima. And some of these same fields are, are sitting between four and five right now. And so they're, you know, even if you think there's a fair amount of summer left, and even if you have some water left, dedicate to those fields, the plants think otherwise, and they're working their way toward cutout. And so, again, if you're happy with the way the fruit set is going, and you still have some water available, it's just sort of a nice, easy tool to give you an idea whether you've got a little bit of horsepower left in those plants to put on some more fruit, or whether things are going to kind of wrap up and wind down. And uh, again, I know this is a complicated year. A lot of the fields that are rapidly progressing toward cutout that have a pretty nice fruit set on them uh, with threats of late season aphids, white fly, limited water. You know, that might be a nice combination. You know, wrap up some of those fields, have them ready for an earlier harvest, earlier defoliation. Maybe that fits nicely into the pattern for some people. And for other people, that's sort of a lost opportunity of trying to push the plants one last time to get a little bit more uh, uh, yield out of them. So, um, and then I think the last thing I'll mention is that in some fields that I've been in the last uh, two weeks in Kings County and uh, Tulare County, um, to me they're a, a, just almost a perfect example of a, of a setup for potassium deficiency. Because what they are is they're modest sized plants with a just tremendous fruit load for the size of the plant. So it's, it's a, a relatively small plant, big fruit load for the amount of leaf area that's there on those plants. And unless those plants have access to some reason for the root system to expand, I think they're gonna be candidates for running out of potassium and maybe nitrogen. Uh, and that'll be one of the yield limiting or kind of season ending issues in some of those fields. And so, uh, I've had a couple discussions in the last uh, 10 days or so, uh, which I haven't heard questions about it for a while, about foliar uh, K and N applications and about light water run nitrogen applications. And again, it's not something we always really like to recommend. Usually foliar N and K is one of those type of things that it works maybe, what, what would you say, Dan, maybe two thirds of the time? Or half of the time. It's not a slam dunk that every time you'll get a response out of what is a relatively light N or K application. Um, and the same thing really applies with some of the water applications that are relatively light. But again, if you're in those areas where you tend to have maybe a long efficiency type of symptoms in the late season, you know, to me this is one of those type of years that this is going to be seen in a lot of different spots. 
We and saw it for the first time last year up, up in this area for, for yeah. a number of fields, and it was the first time really that we we did it for a while. Yeah, it well, early, it was an early season. Uh, you know, we had a lot of development early right. on, good fruit set, and the, the conditions you described. Yeah, and, and actually, I, I'm glad Dan mentioned that, Josh. I think Dan and I talked about this last year. One of the really wild things in, in all the years I've been doing work at the Westside Research Center for over 30 years, and we had locations within uh, probably within five miles or less of Westside that I had never seen potassium deficiency or those type of symptoms. So we confirmed that they actually were deficient in potassium. I've never seen that. Well, these particular fields were alternate row, surface drip irrigated. So no big pre-plant irrigation. There was no good stored soil water with depth. It was you know, really a, a nice looking field of cotton or multiple ones with a with a, a pretty good sized plant, you know, not huge, but maybe about three feet tall, two and a half feet, three feet tall about this time of year, with a really good fruit set. But again, because of the way they were watered and the lack of a good solid pre-plant irrigation or rainfall, stored, you know, stored rainfall water, uh, the root zone was small. And so my take on potassium deficiency and I know there's been 20 years, 50 years, whatever arguments between people over is it verticillium or is it potassium deficiency and all this. My feeling year in and year out is where you see potassium deficiency is where you have a plant. It can be a five foot tall plant with a giant fruit load. It can be a two and a half foot tall plant with little leaf area, but a big fruit load for the size of plant. And that is gonna tend to cut off additional root development early. And if you're not exploring as big a root volume, then you're not getting access to as much in the way of nutrients. And so it can be water related, uh, salinity related, compaction related, uh, root pruning with a treflan application. It can be a whole pile of different things. But if you've got a sort of a mediocre root system, um, combined with a, a, a plant with a whole lot of fruit for the size that the plant is. Um, to me, that's a really good setup for potassium deficiency. So we've had some locations, and again, I, I kind of hesitate to say this, but we've had a few places down in the Button Willow area on some fairly heavy ground where we kind of went along and made some measurements in some grower fields where they did strip trials where we had uh, low, you know, for the season, relatively low early uh, declining nodes above yellow flower on a pima field. Plants like the ones I was just describing, and then we actually went in and they did a foliar, and they did a about a 20 pound uh, water run application with uh, the irrigation that they put on at that time of the year. And uh, and actually we got a nice, a nice yield response on it. And so it's not a slam dunk, but I think that type of a setting is, is, is worth looking at because I'm, we're trying to ask everybody, I know Dan and I are involved in some things where you're trying to continue to ask people to be really tight on what they do with nitrogen management. But again, it still comes down to what kind of a fruit load do you have on the plant and do you think you have a, a, a system that's able to supply those, those nutrient needs when you get into these types of situations. And I think this is one of those type of years where some fields are likely to show some of those type of problems. So uh, again, I think we're still against, I, I know the guy I was talking to down in the Buttwell area, if you, if you say, let's put on 20 pounds of nitrogen, everybody's used to thinking, well, yeah, okay, it sounds like a good idea, why don't I, I'll put on 45. And so, you know, we actually held to keeping it to a small number. And I don't think there's much risk of the plant, you know, taking off on you. We're doing something negative in that type of a situation, and and I think there there may be some of those type of opportunities in here like this with a with a fruit load, uh, like some of these plants are going to have on. So, again, that might be a good thing to you know have some arguments about later on if you wish, but uh, just some general observations, uh, you know, based based on some things I've been seeing. Bob, did you see the sort of late season decline in general last year? As you know, and, and did you really? Were you, can you really distinguish it between that and, and then potassium deficiency specifically? Uh, I don't know if everybody heard Dan's question about you know late season decline in general and whether you can.
classify that always as potassium deficiency? And I think the answer still is no. Um, I mean, I think you spoke to it with yeah, the, when not, the root it, it isn't, not being developed. It, yeah, I mean, it, it isn't true in every case. I mean, you know, yes, we still do have verticillium that will hit some fields, you know, and parts of fields harder than others. And that won't be necessarily linked to potassium deficiency. Um, but, but I do think if you start seeing, um, you know, say you're, you're just past or right around, say you're, say you're uh, in the third or fourth week of bloom. So in a good production, especially with something like Pima, you know, you're near peak bloom or right around peak bloom. And some of the work in foliars would suggest that you're not quite yet too late to do any type of application. And if you're seeing, you know, uh, say three or four weeks in a, in a field that, that, that you're applying any water to, if you're seeing three or four weeks into, into bloom, uh, nodes above yellow flower that are hitting four to five, and you're already seeing what looks like some bronzing or something like that, or you say, or one of the few people I think anymore that take, uh, take uh, uh, leaf samples for, uh, for potassium, um, and you see low numbers, I mean, I think, you know, it's a, it's a very good possibility that that's going to be potassium deficiency. And the frustrating thing with potassium deficiency and why I think it's really hard for growers and consultants to make recommendations um, is, is that you can get a potassium deficiency in years where I think you have root, root system development problems or giant fruit loads on relatively small plants. You know, for the size of the fruit load, you can you can get those kind of problems even if your soil test numbers actually look pretty good on potassium. And that you talk to somebody like uh, I know I worked for quite a few years looking at fields. And Pete always has his uh, stump the chump comment. I mean, and this was perfect for me. It always it was a location where I'd get stumped over and over. Joe Fabry would have fields where they had done probably 20 years of potassium strip trials in terms of potassium applications. And over all the stuff he did over probably a couple decades, I think it was probably about a 50-50. So half of the time they got a yield response, half of the time they didn't get a yield response. They put out 100 to 400 pounds of potassium. And with the potassium fixation issues in a lot of these fields, you know, it just wasn't always something that so, um, I don't know, that's a convoluted way of answering your question, but I still think that most of the time I see potassium deficiency, I can talk myself into it being related to a plant that doesn't have a big enough root system uh, to get access to uh, uh, the potassium that, that's present in the field. And so, even if you've got exchangeable K test numbers that come out at way beyond that 140 part per million recommendation, um, uh, you can still see it, uh, again, if the root system is weak and you're trying to take care of a great big bowl load. So that's probably a lousy answer, but... Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we used to see and, a lot of that late season decline. It seemed to be maybe more prevalent in some of the acute varieties, and, but it still still seems to rate its head once in a while in certain fields, and it's, it is hard to, you know, the, it has some of the distinguishing characteristics Right. Well, I think, I think to some extent, if we have more and more people that are going toward drip irrigation, we have more and more people that are, uh, you know, in water short years with some annual crops that are considering doing things with, you know, alternate row irrigation or really widely spaced drip laterals on 60 inch beds or something like that. You know, if you're trying for relatively high yields, I mean, that's that's a scenario that doesn't play really well for, you know, the, the native soil without fertilizer applications being able to meet all of the needs for the crop. And so I think, you know, if you look at what they did early on in citrus, when they switched to microsprays or some of the drip systems and everything, really one of the first things that hit them a couple of years into it was they felt like they did a much better, better job with water but they ran into all kinds of nutrient management issues related to you know, switching to micro-irrigation on citrus. So I think to some extent that's some of the stuff that we're seeing. And uh, 
uh, I don't know, it may be one of those challenges that I, I know I'm not that up on. Uh, reasonable cost, for instance, of potassium sources that you can inject in drip systems. So maybe Dan or somebody knows a little more about that. I know the older materials that I used to use were pretty pricey. And so in some studies that I was involved in a long time ago down in Imperial Valley, what we did is we, we were doing uh, uh, shanked in strip applications of, of potassium, you know, kind of like a banded uh, uh, application that we were fairly positive was going to be in the main part of the wetted root zone. And we were doing those type of potassium applications as sort of a hedge against uh, running into some problems. So uh, I haven't done that for a while, so there may be some opportunities to look at some of those kind of issues again. Okay. All right. I, um, I'm going to hang around for a little while, so if there are any questions or something that pop up, uh,